Just want to take a minute just to welcome everybody uh, for coming tonight. And uh, thank you very much just for being here and supporting this program and for like really being interested in learning about this topic that we're going to have for you tonight. Tonight's event is hosted by the Counseling Al Alumni Connection. The Counseling Al Alumni Connection is an alumni organization created from our alumni for this department specifically about two years ago. The purpose of the alumni organization is really for uh, alumni and current students to be able to interact, network, uh, enrich each other's lives, stay connected to each other, stay connected to the university, stay connected you know, to our department. So tonight's uh, event is part of that. This is an enrichment uh, program. This is a new series that we're rolling out called From Our Own. And that series is uh, presentations from alum of our program for alum and current students of our program, okay? So um, the um, first presenter that we have in this series, we're very happy uh, to have tonight, is Sharon Murray. She is an alum of our organization, of, of our department from 2013. Um, she's going to be presenting on adoption counseling, and um, Sharon did an independent, independent study on that specific topic under the esteemed Dr. Caviola. Um, and so she'll be presenting on that niche uh, counseling um, um, triad tonight. Uh, Sharon is currently working as a uh, counseling supervisor at Family Options, uh, which is in Red Bank. So it's my pleasure to announce Sharon Murray. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm very excited to be here um, for a few reasons. One is that this program meant so much to me, and I got so much out of this program that I really felt like I wanted to give back. And I wouldn't have even known anything about adoption counseling if I hadn't been in my internship class. And I took a variety of internships because I wanted to have a wide range of experience with internships. And I found myself during one of them at Family Options, which was an adoption center. And once I started working there, I started doing more research and trying to get as much information as you could. Those of you who are in internships, you know when you're thrown into it, you feel a little like, I don't, I don't know enough about this. But, you know, I need to, I'm not ready for this. I don't know what I'm doing. So I did the same thing. I was feeling kind of insecure and went in and said, you know, do some research. You know, look up that family uh, counseling textbook and there's no chapter here on adoption. Well, let me look at other universities. Let's see what they have. Maybe they might get a test one of them. And I have done a search across the country to many universities that offer graduate programs in counseling. And I can tell you, I have not found one that includes adoption counseling in their family counseling or any part of their site counseling program. That was mind-blowing to me. So I decided, um, <coughs> I would ask Dr. Caviola if he would work with me doing an independent study if I could do that. And he said yes. And that really changed the direction of my life in counseling. So I did this independent study and I really kind of dove in. And what I have learned is that this is a niche of counseling that most of us aren't really aware of. And it does require training. And you're kind of on your own to get the training. So hopefully that can change. You're probably the first group of people in a graduate program that are having training of any sort in adoption counseling. And I hope that by the end of this evening, you will realize the value of having a little bit of information about this. Because what's the first thing that they tell us is, don't do any harm. We don't want to harm our clients. And if we aren't aware that what we're saying might cause harm, well, our, our clients are in danger. So really, it's a call to arms to us to make sure that we're saying the right things when we're working with people that are members of the triad. So the triad would be adoptees, would be people that, who, who have adopted children, adopted families, and birth parents. So just to show up hands, just for me to know, how many of you have ever known anyone that was adopted? Keep your hands up. How many of you know anyone that adopted a child? And keep those hands still up. And how many of you know anyone that's placed a child for adoption? Okay. So of those three categories, I would venture to say that most people in this room have encountered someone in that triad. 
And you can assume that in whatever kind of counseling practice you have, whatever area of counseling you have, you will encounter someone from this triad. And you may not realize it, they may not present with that information immediately. And as I was telling to, to Michael before we started, um, if you know more about adoption counseling and some of the experiences that members of the triad have, have it may occur to you, that might be a question to ask this person. I'm seeing something here that might indicate they were adopted. And you might ask the question. So we're going to start with um, just some basic information because this, there's so much involved in this that it would be you know, an entire course. But I want, to, I want you to have an idea of, you know, of what's involved. So what's so great about you being here tonight? There's a lot of really good things about you being here tonight. So most counselors will encounter members of that triad in, in whatever area they're working in counseling. But very few are prepared to deal with adoption issues. And as a result, our clients are, can be misunderstood, they can be misdiagnosed, um, or just, you know, the, the best case scenario, just not properly treated. So we want to avoid that. And unfortunately, in the absence of a formal education, we're relying on what everyone else does, which is social media and images and in film, and the first thing I tell people when I'm working with adoptive families is stop watching Lifetime movies. <laughs> it's just not accurate, and it just scares people, and that, that level of anxiety, you know, kind of goes up, and they're like, should I be expecting them to be in the bushes? You know, I mean, some really, you know, you're just feeling the anxiety coming off people, and so the information that we get in the media is really not good. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, you have when you leave some understanding of um, the value of this, but also the relevance when you're dealing with your clients. Um, unfortunately, and I've spoken to a lot of families who have sought counseling for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they have an adolescent adoptee who's having some issues, um, and they bring them for counseling. And I'll hear stories about how they've been to counselors that sadly have not had any training, and the client finds themselves in the position of educating their therapist on what they should be saying. Well, you shouldn't have said that to me. That hurts my feelings. Or this is how we talk in the world of adoption. So I wouldn't want to be in the circumstance of having a client explain to me what I should be doing, and I'm sure that you wouldn't either. So it's good. I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up on what we want to look for. Okay. So. The first things that we need to know about adoption is it's changed dramatically. So someone who's placed a child for adoption or an adoption experience 30 years ago is very different than what we're seeing today in modern adoption. Very different. So openness in adoption, I'm sure everyone has heard this term. It's a vague term. It can mean anything from meeting a birth family prior to a placement to ongoing contact um, throughout a lifetime and anything in between. But that's what we're looking at, 99% of adoptions today um, that are domestic, voluntary adoptions um, are open adoptions. Most people, this is the direction that we're going, thank goodness all the research tells us this is the direction we should be going, and there is basically almost no research to the contrary. Um, okay. So, cons concerns in adoption, the members of the triad will experience some of the same things. So everyone in the triad is experiencing some amount of loss. So grief and loss are definitely part of adoption counseling. Um, so you would need to be prepared to deal with people who have experienced grief, loss, separation. In some cases, um, we can see bonding and attachment issues, um, conflicted identity. So the important thing for you to know when you're first going into it is Adoption is part of, of maybe who someone is, but it doesn't define them, and it's our jobs as counselors is to be able to differentiate, is this an adoption issue that they're presenting with, or is it something else? You know, we don't want to pathologize the client by thinking, oh, they're adopted, that must be their problem. No, that doesn't have to be their top problem. We need to know what the relevance is in their life um, as far as their adoption status. So um, again, we're shifting from this perspective of pathology to one of resiliency. You know, we're keeping it positive. We're not, we're not labeling people. We're not judging people. And we're trying to balance, you know, 
what's, what is presenting with this client as far as the relative merits of their adoption experiences, maybe the risks of their adoption experience, especially that the risk might be attachment and bonding um, disorders if they're adopted later, say two years old, or international adoptions, children that have been in orphanages, these would be at a higher risk for bonding and attachment issues. Um, but always to remain respectful and non-judgmental and to utilize positive adoption language. Language is a funny thing. I'm just going to hand out some cards. And, and then we'll um, language is something that's it's tricky. We learn from society around us what to say, how to say it. A lot of times we don't stop and think, how is this being perceived? What does this mean? What kind of judgment am I making when I'm saying something? So I'll have a handout for you that is about positive and negative adoption language. But for now, I'm, I just want you to take a look at some of these cards. And if you don't mind, those of you that have them, just to let us know what you have. And then maybe as a group, you can call out whoever is brave enough. Do you think that's a positive thing to say, or could that be a negative thing to say? So Jen, what do you have? Real parent. A real parent. We use this term a lot. Mm -hmm. So do you think that if somebody asks you, do you know who your real parent is, is that a positive or a negative, do you suppose? Negative. 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 Right. Um, and what that does for the adoptive parent is feel like, I'm not real. But, you know, I see people joking, they're punching, saying, gee, you feel real. Yeah. Um, so yes, that would be a negative. A birth parent? A birth parent. It is. It's a positive. It's it's just a you know, it's it's a descriptor of someone that gave birth to someone. This is the birth parent. There's no judgment on it. Anybody with another card? Born to unmarried parents. Someone that's born to unmarried parents. Seems this is a little tricky. I mean, it's factual, but it seems stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's factual. So. It's not negative in that way, unless you think that people should be married when they have children. I guess that could be, you know, it, so it could, it could involve a social stigma in that way. But it's generally a positive term, and it will really seem positive when you look at the opposite of that. Does anybody have a card that might be the opposite of born to unmarried parents? Anybody have a card that says something that might be the negative way of saying that? Illegitimate child. That's right. We have a winner. It's the illegitimate child. And how can you be an illegitimate person? It just is negative and it doesn't even make sense. But we say that and you'll hear it all the time. People say, oh, he's illegitimate. What does that even mean? That's kind of like saying someone is illegal. No, they can be undocumented. But how could a human being be illegal? That doesn't that's just, it's this negative connotation. Um, do we have any other cards out there? You got a natural child or parent? A natural child or parent. Or a natural parent. It sounds negative. Yes, me. yes. So, um, <laughs> although it's, you know, I had this image of someone with ring flowers around their, you know, in their hair, uh, you know tracing through a, a meadow, but a natural, that means that the, uh, the opposite parent is unnatural. Because mm -hmm. right? that's, that's what we would assume, when you're the natural parent, and then what the adoptive family is the unnatural parent. So a natural parent isn't a good way to say it. Anyone else? I have foreign adoption. A foreign adoption. I think alien when I hear that. Mm -hmm. Alien adoption. So, what do you think? It's negative. And I think someone has a card that's the opposite of that, that would be a better way of saying it. International, international adoption. Inter Intercountry, yeah, international. It's interesting you say it's got a negative connotation because um, a couple I know actually adopted their children from China and they actually said that they're foreign adoption. They, they use that all the time when they speak about it. Right. And the adoptive parents probably haven't thought, you know, that that's anything mm -hmm. negative. They're not. Yeah, they don't think it is. Right, but I wonder how the child might feel mm -hmm. coming, you know, a foreign child or a ch 
child from a foreign place. It may not, you know, impact them that much, but it might. To me, the word foreign kind of kind of connotes not a part of. That's right. Not a part of this part of this unit. You're right. <clears throat> It does, it does connect you with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a good point because we have a lot of people who have adopted children who continue to use this language. <coughs> so it's not just those of us who aren't part of the triad that use it. Members of the triad use it too. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the better we know, but we do know that some people are offended by some of these things. It can be touchy for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else with a card? Gave up or put up for adoption? Right. I'm getting the head shake now. <laughs> no, that's not a that's not a good thing to, to, to say that someone gave up. It's almost like they gave up on the baby. If they just uh, it, it, it sounds like the baby wasn't wanted. And I can tell you that every birth mother I've encountered, or my colleagues have encountered. And most of the research will tell you the same thing. Birth mothers love their children. They're not giving up on them. They're placing them in a home where they feel they can do better. Because for whatever's happening in their lives right now, they're not able to provide for that child the way they want to. So they're lovingly placing a child for adoption. They're not giving up on the child. They're not giving up. And the term put up, which I made Matt cringe before when I explained to him how this happened. I told him I'm going to tell you, but I can't resist. Um, that term came from many years ago when, again, when adoption was very different than it is today. <coughs> during the Depression, children couldn't care, parents couldn't care for their children anymore, so they would put them on these adoption trains that crossed the country. <coughs> and children were literally, as the train came into each station, put up on the platform, and the townspeople would come and pick them. Mm and take them. So they were put up for adoption. We don't do that anymore, and we, we don't like to say it anymore. Um, but that's where it came from. And who would you think got picked during during hard times? Strong boys that could work on a farm, or the cute little girl. So it was, it was rough, it was a rough time. <coughs> Any other cards? I had chose to keep the baby. Chose to keep the baby. Okay, keep the baby. What do we think of that one? That's kind of the same, in the same vein as, you know, you either give up or you keep. So it, it is perceived as it's negative. It's almost as treating it like an object. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Or a burden. A burden. Or keep or, it, even yeah, though it's yeah. a burden. But, mm -hmm. Right. But definitely, you know, possession. Decided to keep it because the, the alternative to that is to give it up. Um, so that's a negative to keep it. Um, does anyone have the opposite of that? I'm not sure what cards I have out there. I think it chose to parent the baby. That's correct. Yes. So instead of saying I decided to keep the baby, these these people have decided that yes, they're going to parent their child. Um, that's the decision to make. Shall I parent or shall I place? As opposed to give up or put up or keep. So language is a, is a very big deal for adoptees especially, um, but also for the other members of the triad. So if you're working with someone who is an adoptee, and this may, you may be working with them and it has nothing to do with their adoption status. They may have a substance abuse problem or something else. Um, but for you to ask a question like, so, um, do you know who your real mother is in an interview, or do you know why your real mother gave you up? Mm -hmm. You just shut a door and you don't even know you did it. And when you have a, a client who is looking at you saying, this person doesn't understand me, because if they did, they wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. So language, if you take nothing else away from tonight, I want you to take the language piece away because it's really big. And I, I will, I'm going to pass around this handout if there isn't enough to make copies. And this is the language, just a couple of examples of what we just talked about too. 
Um, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint or any of my references, it's available through email. So if you leave your email before you leave, I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, another thing that kind of surprises people, because we have these perceptions in our head of what adoption is, right? And who places for adoption? The demographics usually surprise people. I have, you know, adoptive parents come into the agency saying, you know, what are the chances that I could be placed with a Caucasian child? Mm -hmm. Well, most women who place children for adoption are Caucasian. Most families who adopt children are Caucasian. It's kind of a Caucasian thing. So culturally, that started, we're starting to see a change in the gender demographics now. So we're seeing women of color who culturally did not place before. It was more collective society. <coughs> Members, family, and friends would kind of take care of, you know, raising this child if the birth parents weren't able to do that. Um, but now I'm seeing women of color coming forward and saying, no, I want to place my child in a situation that's different and better than I can provide right now, and I don't want to repeat the cycles of my family. These people are extremely courageous. I can tell you that. I have known several birth parents of color, birth mothers specifically, who when they told their families that they were placing their, ch their child when the child's born, in adoption, they were kicked out of their homes. They had no place to live. Family did not buy into that. But with education and meeting with the family and addressing the family's concerns about that, because they didn't want to lose a link to this child who they felt was their Western blood, um, when they had the concept of openness and adoption presented to them and the possibilities of what adoption can bring to your life today, those attitudes are changing through education. So it's, it's very important when working with those families, too, because a birth mother doesn't live in a vacuum. You know, she's got family and friends, and that all has to be considered. Whoever is in your support group has to be considered. Um, yeah, some of the other facts, um, most people who place children for adoption um, come from relatively small, intact families with college-educated parents of economic means. Um, they're likely to be in the suburbs or the cities. Again, rural communities tend to, you know, kind of have more of a collective uh, mentality, society, so they take care of their own. Um, and women who place generally do have higher academic aspirations. They want to finish school. Um, they think about future goals. Another point in here that I, that I didn't mark is the age. So most people think that birth mothers who place children for adoption are teenagers. Teenagers don't generally place children for adoption. They're developmentally not there. They're not really understanding what it takes to parent a child and what the child needs. Most of the women who place children for adoption are college age and older, so 20s and 30s. These are people that have a real understanding for what it, it is required. Um, they want their child to have whatever it is, you know, two-parent homes sometimes. Um, we, when we meet with birth parents, we talk to them about what are your hopes and dreams. That's one of the things we talk about in counseling sessions with birth parents for you and for your child. So a common scenario of people that we might see would be unexpectedly pregnant women who are newly independent, living on their own. These are people who are not really in a position to parent a child at this point. Or um, single women who are parenting other children and just don't feel that they can parent another child at the time. We also, and I've also seen in, in our practice, a lot of um, two-parent households, married couples that place children in production. So this is not an unusual scenario. Um, these are people that are struggling. They're struggling. They're, they're a couple and they're struggling as opposed to a single person is struggling. It's, it's no different. Um, and I think that's a little different than what most people think. So who do you think might possess the greatest influence on a woman who's considering placing a child for adoption or making an adoption plan? Who do you think is the, is the person that is of greatest influence for this woman making an adoption? The father? The mother. The mo her mother? Yeah. We have a winner. It's her mother. It is the birth mother's mother. And not necessarily the birth father. Um, research has, has shown that the relationship that a woman has with her mother and whether her mother accepts this decision is that they have the greatest influence on, on the decision that's made. So how does society view birth mothers? Not, not very not in a very nice life. 
So you have a few people that will say, oh, they're, you know, they're selfless. These are you know, wonderful people. But in general, <laughs> birth parents tend to be met with an air of suspicion. Um, they're thought of being careless and irresponsible, selfish, and, and it should be uncaring. So how does that affect the birth parent knowing and getting these, you know, this kind of feedback from society? Well, they're, they're feeling shame, they're feeling, you know, they, they can't tell anybody, they shouldn't tell anybody, they shouldn't expose themselves. It's very lonely. Um, so our job as counselors is to reframe some of these societal negative attitudes and, you know, we recognize that this birth mother is here because she loves her child and she wants, you know, what's best for the child. And, and just to kind of validate your birth parents like that. Um, and to, to talk with them about sharing information. Not everyone wants to do that for a variety of reasons. But that's a subject that you should broach. Should you talk about, you know, who have you told? Who have you told you're pregnant? Who have you told that you have an adoption plan? Is there anybody that, you know, is a support for you in this? Who's there for you? Who's going to be there for you throughout the pregnancy? Who's going to be there for you when you deliver? Who's going to be there afterwards? Um, so we want to identify these sources of support. And then you also want to have an idea of what's out there in the community as far as, you know, referral for support. So birth parents have a variety of feelings, um, not the least of which are all the things on here, but um, ambivalence is a big one. So you're going to have decisions throughout a pregnancy of, yes, I think this is the right thing to do, to, I don't know, I don't know, or something will happen. So birth father will come into the picture. We can do this. Okay, we're going to do this. No, we can't do this. So there's going to be, it's a little bit of a roller coaster ride, and, and really you just need to be able to allow people to go through it, to experience it, to come, they will come to that decision. For some people, it happens very late. For some people, it happens at the time of birth, that they've been considering this all along, and now a decision has to be made. So I have had probably 40% of our placements have come from hospital calls last minute. That's a big percentage. Most people have this idea that they're going to um, be connected with a birth mother, they're going to get to know her, they're going to have a couple of months of, you know, getting to know each other and plan for the baby and, and do all this stuff, but really, a lot of times, it's the last minute call, you've been selected, can you be at the hospital tomorrow? So, adoptive families have to be prepared for that too. They have to be prepared for the long wait, and they also have to be prepared for the not long wait. And I have had families that were not prepared when they got the call, and people wait a year or two for this call, by the way, who got the call and said, we can't pull it together by tomorrow. Almost forgetting like they've been waiting for a year. So setting expectations and preparing people, that's a big part of, of working with the doctor families, too. You know, conversely, I, I had a friend in high school who became pregnant, and she um, planned, she was going to um, adopt, put, I almost said put the baby up, I'm It's sorry. okay, but you know, um, <laughs> see, you stopped yourself, yeah. though. <laughs> um, and so she, you know, was at least seemed fairly certain that that was her decision, but after she gave birth and saw the baby, she just changed her mind. And I'm, does that, that happens pretty frequently, I imagine? It doesn't happen that frequently when you've had a lot of counseling. Oh. She because that's what we yeah. work out beforehand. Yeah. We talk about all that stuff that goes into that decision-making process, and we do visualizations and a lot of things beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, the state of New Jersey right now is requiring that when a birth mother presents, that we offer at least three counseling sessions before she makes an adoption choice. Because we want to go over all her other options. What are her options? What are some of the things that are, you know, factoring into all of this? In a non-judgmental way, we don't have a vested interest. Even people at the adoption agency don't. We want to have placements that are right for everyone. Because our fiduciary responsibility is to all members of the tribe, and most specifically, most specifically to the adoptee. So we want to make sure that this is something that works for everyone. And we want firm decisions by the time the baby is placed. Or as firm as they can be. People can change their mind. I've only seen one person change her mind. But 
truthfully, I didn't think she really had a firm decision. So it didn't surprise me. And that was okay, as long as you prepare your adoptive family. That I'm seeing this as a risky placement. This, you know, she's saying one thing, but, you know, how will you feel if it doesn't, you know, let's, let's talk about what might happen if this doesn't go through. And prepare them for that, too, because there's no guarantees on adoption. So preparation is really a big thing. A lot of our work is done before, a lot of work is done prior to the placement. Um, so we want to encourage the clients to verbalize the hopes for the future, both for themselves but also for their child. So some of the things that go into the decision, um, so we, we talk about all these different questions because being able to make these decisions help a birth mother feel like she has some sense of control over a situation that she feels powerless in sometimes. Sometimes people feel like, I don't, I don't, there is no other real choice for me, I have to do this. So that's something, we don't want that to be just this blanket statement that someone says. We want to break it down. All right, let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So what would, what would life look like if you chose to parent? You know, who do you have in your life that might be support for you? How, how might that look? Would you have to work? Maybe we can connect you with services, if you need services. Um, and to talk about who would be in her life. Um, would life be comfortable, manageable, or would it require such a difficult, you know, overwhelming effort? Does she see this as being such a struggle for so long, and maybe never not being a struggle? Um, what would life be like if they got to choose the place that their child got to live, if they got to choose the adoptive family? I can tell you that many birth mothers, I would say most, that we see presented will come in and say, um, I'd like to select the family, and I have books up here, by the way, in the front if you want to take a look at them later. These are our rating families. Um, and they look through the books and you know they, they want to select a family, but then afterwards, I don't want any contact. And really what we're hearing when we hear birth mothers say that is, I don't deserve to have contact or updates. So we work with that. And then by the, by the time we're through with counseling, they feel entitled to get an update, that it's okay for them to say, I'm still gonna love this child. I still wanna know what my child's doing. And that helps them after the adoption to have these updates. It's really, um, it confirms that they made a good decision. That's something they can feel good about. Um, so these are some more of the questions we ask. Do they, you know, what kind of contact do they see? Um, what are the hospital preferences? And again, these are fluid kind of conversations to have. Because you may have one day where she says, I love these people, I want them to be in the delivery room, they're awesome, not him, but I want her to be in the delivery room. And then, you know, the day could come that birth is, you know, she's ready to go in and she says, I don't want anybody around me. <laughs> and that's okay. Um, or she may say, I want to nurse the baby until the baby is discharged and I have to say my, my final, final goodbye in the sense that she's this child's parent, but not final goodbye in the sense that she's going to lose contact with this child. But that's a birth parent's time at that hospital. So we want to give her the opportunity to make decisions on how she wants to see that happen. We want her to be able to say hello to this child before, before she's asked to say goodbye. So nursing doesn't mean that, just because a birth mother is connecting with her child in a very intimate way, that doesn't mean that she's changing her mind. She's choosing to place the child for adoption because she thinks that that's in the best interest of this child. And that's why she takes care of herself during pregnancy. That's why she wants to nurse when the baby's born. The concept of a birth mother nursing a baby scares people. The looks on people's faces, if it's not the adoptive family when they first hear about this, it's their parents who say, oh no, oh no, this is a bad idea. Or the older generation may say to the adoptive family, you don't need to be sending them pictures after you, you have the baby. So, yeah. I was just about to ask, um, does the adoptive family have any say in um, what goes on with the mother and, and the baby when it's born and, and having that um, immediate um, uh, 
um, breastfeeding and, and connection with the baby, or how much say and how much control do they have and input do they have in um, Well, they certainly the have input process. because we like to, to establish a relationship. So the two parties do talk about what they all feel comfortable with. Okay. So a birth mother might say, would you like to come into the delivery room? And the adoptive family can, you know, can say, love that opportunity, or they could say, we'll wait outside, we get a little nervous around the you know, hospital stuff. Uh, they have that kind of input. They, have, they don't really have control over it, though. I mean, they're not, this child has not been placed with them. So the birth mother has all the decision making at that point. Um, and it's funny because beforehand, before the actual placement, if you're looking at it from like a power st standpoint, the adoptive family, they're usually very willing to consent to anything. Oh, we'll give you contact, we'll, we'll do this, we'll do that, we'll do the other thing, anything you need, anything you want. Um, it's our job to kind of sim it down, sim it down. Let's not commit to anything we can't follow through on because what we do know about birth mother grief is the worst thing that can happen is to break the plan for birth mother, to promise her ongoing contact or updates and then just cut her off. That's the worst thing we can do. We never want to establish that. So we kind of temper those adoptive families and what they're promising the world, right? Now, after the placement, the power shifts. Because after the placement, all of those agreements that they made, they're not legally binding in the state of New Jersey or in any other state. That may change one day, but right now they are not. So that's why the importance of building relationships is so tremendous. Because we're hoping to really have all the members understand the value of this openness moving forward. Because when they're not required to do that, they may not. We hear a lot about how uh, breast milk is supposed to be really good for infants. Is it ever the case that nursing goes on after the placement? Sometimes. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Some birth mothers do offer to do that. It becomes a logistical problem. Sure, yeah. Um, because they don't generally, families like might know the general area that they live, but they're not going over for Sunday dinner. They're not coming over to drop off breast milk. So a lot of times the agency would have to find some way of getting that. So it gets a little tricky. We've, we've had a couple of clients that did that, and they would freeze the breast milk mm -hmm. and then we'd bring it over, and it, uh, truthfully, it didn't last very long. Sure. But the intent was there, which was great, and yeah. the baby did get the first couple of weeks with the, you know, yeah. the breast milk. Thanks. But I just think that was such a testament to the birth mother to want to offer to do that. <coughs> yeah. And really for the adoptive family, too. That's, that's them embracing her as this child's birth mother. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have one question. I know you said, like, stop looking at Lifetime, you know, <laughs> you see movies and shows and things, but there have been shows or movies where I've seen where the adoptive family has been overly involved, where the mother is so, like, enmeshed with the uh, birth mother where, you know, there is the specificity and what she wants and um, things for the baby and right. all that extra pre-planning that goes on. Um, to help, I guess, convince the birth mother that she's making the right choice mm -hmm. and that they're a, a fitting couple or family to, to adopt the, the baby. So yeah. does, does any of that go on in terms of like, um, the whole power and the control piece, I guess? I'm still trying to understand that, like, how when involved? When you have counselors involved, not so much. Okay. Because we try to temper everybody and set expectations that are realistic for everyone. And we see someone like having too much contact, mm -hmm. calling every day, calling birth mom. Because a lot of times they'll exchange phone numbers during pregnancy, okay. and they'll text, you know, whatever. That how are you feeling today? How are you doing? Th these are nice relationships that we generally mm -hmm. build. So, but if we see somebody that's doing too much, um, and we know what's happening there. She's there. They're trying to seal the deal. Right. Exactly. That's so, <laughs> right. So we'll say we'll say to the adoptive family. I'll I'll, I'll say to them. We need to be very mindful of setting the expectation for how much contact we have now because this will be what will be expected afterwards. And you're going to be having a baby to take care of it. You're not going to have time to do this 24-7. Mm -hmm. So that's going to make her feel out of the loop. So let's try to you know, set a schedule mm -hmm. for what 
you might be able to do afterwards as well. So that's all, that's all in that um, setting appropriate expectations. Um, setting appropriate boundaries. Right. That's another thing that, you know, is part of the relationship building. So we do have, I mean, some, some families will have contact directly, like you said, with texting or people have a, a private Facebook page um, or a web page where they just put pictures of the baby up. Um, some people have all communication through the agency. So they'll send pictures and updates to the agency, then the agency will then send it out to the birth parents and vice versa. The contact and the updates are not one way. We want them to be both ways. And the reason why we want birth mother also updating adoptive family is we want the child to have information about their birth family. Uh, on, ongoing. This is an ongoing conversation. And I, I just also want to explain, speaking of language, right now, just for the purposes of clarification, I'm referring to people as adoptive families. Once they're placed with a the child, they're just the family. Mm -hmm. That's insulting to call a family an adoptive family once they're placed. You're making a negative identification. When you say once the child is placed, that means after the baby's born, literally placed. Literally placed. Placed with that family, literally and legally placed with that family. And just, just as an aside, in the state of New Jersey, you have to wait six months before your adoption is finalized. You need four months of counseling and supervision. Uh, no, six months of counseling and supervision, four sessions before you finalize, and the, and the counselor or the agency has to generate a report um, for the court about this, uh, basically an assessment of the situation for the court, that this is something that's in the best interest of the child. What, I'm just curious, what, um, sorry, so many questions. <coughs> what pays for you, like what is the funding source for your agency? I'm sure it's not, you don't ask the birth mothers to pay, but to the, yeah. Um, the adoptive family pays all the expenses okay. for the birth families. Okay. Okay. So medical people think medical medical expenses are not usually even there. Anybody that doesn't have insurance, um, New Jersey. The one thing I can say about New Jersey is we have great medical care for women who are pregnant and can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So there's almost never a medical cost, but any expenses that would be paid um, for the birth mother um, have to be pregnancy related. Um, something that's related to the pregnancy, you can't, you're not allowed to just buy them a car. Yeah. Take them to the concert or something. No, you can't. It has to be pregnancy related. And you have to have receipts. Okay. Yeah. And they play a, a, pay a placement fee for, you know, the counseling or just being able to generate all this stuff that needs to be generated. And you had another question. Yeah, I'm sorry. 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 Delay before the adoption is final and legal. Does that also allow the birth mother time to yeah. rescind, or is that like once a birth parent? And this is why it's so important <coughs> to work this out with the birth parent prior to birth. Um, it's just a plan until she signs the paper. Then it's a decision. But we want that plan to be really a firm plan before she signs the paper. Because once she signs surrender of parental rights, voluntary surrender of parental rights. Those rights are irrevocable if they're signed in the presence of an agency, a state licensed agency. If they're signed in the presence of an attorney, they're not automatically irrevocable. The attorney then has to go before a judge, which could take two months before they're irrevocable. So a lot of people like to use an agency for a lot of reasons, the counseling services, um, but also surrenders are irrevocable. So birth parents don't get to change their mind. Although, there's one loophole, <laughs> and that is if the agency believes that those surrendered rights happened in a way that wasn't they can revoke that, those surrenders, but they can, they can turn them on. The agency has that ability to do that. Um, we will have two case studies tonight that I'm going to give out, and that will be part of one of them. Um, and then 
you know, just some replacement considerations. Again, you know, we can, in the interest of time, um, kind of, I can send you the PowerPoints and we can just read through slides so we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we want to do when we're considering working with adoptive parents is you always have to kind of check to see what are their attitudes, feelings, and beliefs regarding birth parents, regarding adoption, because a lot of people come into it with those societal notions. So these are pretty, you know, intensive conversations that you're having and several conversations with adoptive families about the process and about expectations and about what actually is in the best interest of your child, what we know about positive outcomes and adoption. There's a lot of education component to this because most people don't come, come to adoption with that much adoption education. So there's a lot of uh, looking at their, their attitudes, most especially their attitudes toward openness. Because most people are afraid of openness when they first hear about it. And then they embrace it because they realize it's such a great way to move forward. Um, so some, some considerations for the adoptive parents, you know, they are having an identity adjustment that has to, they have to come to. So it's difficult for them to kind of take ownership of their new role. Um, it doesn't come to them in the way that, you know, as we're kids, we have this kind of notion that we don't ever, nobody ever questions their fertility until they can't have a child. Everyone seems to make this assumption that, oh, when I'm, this age, or when I'm at this point in my life, I'm going to have children, and, and it's all going to work out. So a lot of the families that we have have come from a history of infertility. Adoption, adoption is, you know, the, the second path to parenthood. Usually biology is the first path to parenthood. So we are dealing with feelings of grief and loss over infertility with the adopted family. And, and so we want to find out, are these feelings of grief and loss resolved enough to move forward with an adoption plan? And a lot of times the response is, why does my grief have to be resolved to move forward with adoption? I, I just want to be a parent. And the ways that it comes out, it's kind of insidious. So if you're thinking, okay, I can't have a biological child, I'm going to adopt. And then I'm going to pretend this child is just my child. We don't have to think about that I didn't biologically have this child. And so if you're thinking, I just want to pretend that I'm the biological parent, what are you going to do with birth families? We don't need to send them any pictures. We don't need, they're not relevant. They're not valued. They're not, we don't need them. What does that do to your child? That's rough. So this is how infertility impacts adoption. Infertility is a huge part of this. Um, so, Grief, again, is a big part of adoption on all levels. Um, okay, so another thing that happens for, that you need to consider is parents may lack a sense of entitlement to parent this child because it's not their biological child. You know, and they've watched another woman and possibly her partner, you know, child father, you know, they've seen the tears at the hospital handing this child over. That's very difficult for some adoptive families to deal with. They feel guilty. They don't feel entitled to parent. And so we, we kind of counsel them. It's okay to feel empathy. You know, we care about these people. These are people we've come to life and, you know, and care about. It's okay to feel that. That doesn't, their tears don't mean they change their mind. It's just sad. It's just sad. So when, an, when the adoptive family is able to have a nice relationship with the birth family, and the birth family is saying to them, you're going to be a great parent. You're going to be a great dad. You're going to be a great mom. That really helps the adoptive family. So that relationship, that openness, really helps that adoptive family because that validation, it's almost like they get permission from the birth family to be a parent. Another reason openness is good for everyone. Um, claiming the child, having that sense of belonging to the child. So naming your child. As soon as you're placed, mm -hmm. meaning physically placed, um, you name that child. Even if birth parents have named the child something different, you get to name that child even though it's not stamped from a judge. You are putting that child on your insurance, um, your name, you take to pediatrician on your name. And that helps for that you know, sense of claiming the child into your family. Sending out birth announcements, um, 
sending out pictures, creating a storybook. The other thing that people don't think about as far as adjustment for adoptive families is um, is the adjustment afterwards. So society doesn't have very much empathy for people who are ad adopted parents. Even though they're just as sleep deprived as biological parents are, they're, they're not, not getting a whole lot of sleep. They have the same stressors. And when they say, oh my god, I'm so tired, I just, I just feel overwhelmed, I, people will look at them and what are they going to say? What are you complaining about? You didn't have to give birth. You're not healing from a birth. So there's very little empathy. Um, so that's another kind of secret world. They don't want to complain because you should be happy. You asked for this. You know, it, it's tough. It's, <laughs> there's a lot involved in that. Okay, and so some therapeutic considerations for the adoptees. This is all developmentally appropriate. We have conversations with adoptees throughout a lifetime. They change as the development changes in a child. Um, and then we just have some things like, you know, birth to three, you have the risk of attachment problems, especially if the child has come from an orphanage or you know, a later adoption. Um, three to seven, you're, you're basically setting up the foundation. So you're reading storybooks, so hearing the language of adoption, they know they're adopted, they know I'm adopted, they don't really know what it means, but it's, you know, I'm adopted, they are sure I'm adopted. You know, it's just, you're kind of introducing the language and the concept, and then, you know, during that three to seven years, you're going to have, a, you know, variability on, on children and developing. So your child kind of, even though you should bring up the subject as a parent, you know, with the stories, you know, occasionally, um, you want, you want to always be open to that just being kind of a natural conversation in the household. You're going to have children that will start asking questions because their cognition is now developing and their sensitivity is developing. So they may say to, you may have an adoptive family call you and say, we didn't know what to say to Jamie because she said to us last night, are you kind of sad that I didn't grow in your tummy? And so what I would recommend for families is be as honest as you can and appropriate. Uh, and if you're feeling sad, then say, sometimes I feel a little sad about that, and then redirect. But we're such, you know, oh, everything's so wonderful, you know, here. So you answer the question. You don't need to elaborate with children at this age. And then, you know, you talk about the positives as well. But avoiding, like, to say, no, I don't, it doesn't really bother me. <laughs> you know, especially if that's not true. Um, it's known when you're honest with them. <coughs> so middle childhood has has its whole a whole other, you know, it's more more cognition, more sensitivity, um, more curiosity about the birth family. They may then start asking, do you think they're sad that they don't get to see it every day? And hopefully by middle childhood they know, you know Sarah is my birth mother. And um, I get updates with birthday cards from Sarah, and once a year we see Sarah. Um, but things happen for middle child, middle childhood in school. So you have the school that not all schools, very few, are sensitive to adoption. So you have assignments like make the family tree, or bring a picture of your birth. Well, this can be very difficult for some adoptees. They may not have it. They may not know their biological tree, and then they don't know exactly how to do the tree with the family, and then, or they know everybody, and then they've got two trees, and they don't know, you know. So these are things that you know would be more difficult for a child at this at this time. And there's there's a lot that we can do to work with the school, and a lot that we can advise our parents too in working with the school. But it's something that our parents also kind of need a heads up on, and to have conversations, you know how might you feel if this happens, or talking with an adopted family, this happened in school, I'm so angry about this, and, and talking that through. It's difficult when people don't have an education, and you do, when you're an adopted parent. So adolescence then, you know, there's then, then we have, if you have, if you have talked to your children about their adoption, if you have told stories, if you have established open communication, and they know something about their birth family, and it's all honky dory, they come to adolescence, we come to identity formation. And so all that information absolutely helps. Um, 
a lack of it can be problematic. So you will have adolescents. The first place that we look is the physical. They're wondering, does somebody out there have my eyes? Do I look like someone? It's the physical is very important to them. They will then start asking more questions about the birth family. And again, there's a great deal of variability in what the interest in adoption will be for adolescents. We generally see girls more interested in their adoption status than boys, but not, you know, not necessarily. It's just something to kind of be mindful of, but they're looking for the they're looking for the missing pieces, and so they'll tend to fill in the missing pieces when they don't have information. So the birth parents tend to either be the hero, the fantasy, wonderful person, or the zero, the loser that had to place me for adoption. Um, the truth is almost always in the middle, but with a lack of information. Um, and I can tell you that I have I feel many calls from 18 year olds on their birthday calling for information about the birth parents. And they don't want to tell their parents that they're asking. So that's a tough situation for them. They love their parents so much they don't want to hurt their feelings by knowing they're curious. Now imagine being a parent. How would you feel if you came home and your, your child is online searching the birth family and you're not part of it? So adoptive families may already feel a little worried that they're not, you know, birth families. Then to find this kind of divide is, is difficult. So as counselors, we have to, this is when the family counseling comes in quite a bit. So we want it, we encourage the adoptee to bring the family into this. Let's, let's deal with this as a family. Let's see what we can find out as a family and what does this mean for everyone here. Um, but that happens quite a bit. And that's because adoptions were done differently 18 years ago than they are now. Hopefully, that's not going to be so much being imposed. Just my question, how long does the services um, provide? How long are they provided to the families once they've been adopted and gone through the whole stages? Forever. Oh, okay. forever. You can call an agency. I, I deal with people that have placed 25 years ago. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then adulthood, you have another surge. So when people are considering you know, and thinking about their lives and marriages and having children, it brings it up again. It brings it up again. So there's another surge, either for, you know, wondering, especially if they're pregnant, the genetic parts of it, but also the feelings that you have when you're pregnant. I wonder how my birth family felt. I wonder what she was going through knowing that she wasn't going to be parenting me. So it does, you know, a lot of these feelings come up again for adult adoptees. Um, and so, we, I'll say this again because it's so important, don't assume that when, when someone from the triad presents to you in counseling that it's an adoption of your problem. Because <laughs> it may not be. You know, it, you have to be able to decipher whether or not this, their adoption status is, is relevant. Um, and then, you know, multicultural, we do have birth, uh, we do have families that are open to placements of children outside of their race. Um, at our agency, we require an additional educational component before you're approved for a home study for this type of placement. And that is because we want to make sure that parents are prepared to not only parent a child outside their race, but an adult outside their race. So someone may be you know, a Caucasian couple and say, we're open to an African-American placement. And so we'll say, okay, that's great. So a couple of questions. Do you have people in your life that are African-American? Well, no. <laughs> How willing are you to diversify your life so that your child has role models, that your child has, has connections to people of the same race. Because you don't adopt a multiracial child, you become a multiracial family. And there is a distinction, a very clear distinction there. Um, and a lot of research on this as well that I can share with you. And this, this could be an entire you know, course in itself. But we do, we do require education for people that want this type of placement. We do not want families that are colorblind. Because when your child leaves your front door, trust me, society will notice that they're not Caucasian. They will no longer be insulated by your white 
privilege. And your white privilege will be diminished. And how do you feel about that? And people will question, so having a child outside of your race is a very obvious sign of the child's doctor. And you will have to field a lot of questions. How are you with feeling, with feeling those questions? How are you with feeling questions like, oh, where is she from? Because many times an adoptee, is, for the rest of their lives, they're assumed they're from another country. Um, so there's a lot of losses there that the family has to be prepared to parent a child and prepared as a family you know, to, to address. Um, it's very complex. Um, you have to acknowledge the diversity. You have to have a plan in advance of how you would incorporate diversity into your lives, and you have to be able to demonstrate that before we approve you know, this real estate placement. Um, and one of the things that I do as a, as a as a little game is I have a big bucket of beads, all different colors, and I give people a paper plate, and I'll say, okay, well, take one of the beads, whatever bead is associated with the color of your race, 